From an Iraq war cover-up to towns ravaged by opioids to the roots of our modern immigration crisis, Embedded explores what's been sealed off and undisclosed. NPR's original investigative podcast reveals why these stories and the people behind them matter. Listen to the Embedded podcast only from NPR. This episode contains strong language and ideation of self-harm and suicide. Please be advised. This season of my story so far has been an amazing journey. Along the way, I met some incredible people with incredible stories. And my son is just crawling in circles. And that was really bizarre to me. It's like one of those things when you look back in life, you didn't know really what it meant at the time. But as years go by, you know exactly what it meant. They were always telling me, don't go, you know? I just pushed her out of the way and I went anyway. And as the fire was spreading from house to house, to garage, to patio, the pops and explosions are further complicating the chaotic environment that the horses are dealing with. The, the first thing she said to me, she looked up at me with teary eyes and she said, Daddy, I've waited my entire life to see that mouse. And everybody knows you get the warm, hot, delicious dishes around the time of winter. And it's so funny, every time I tell this story, I'm about to get this dish. It was a long journey. I was homeless up here for almost a year and a half. I slept on the ground, never done that before, under trees. That was like the wildest experience I ever went through, but I never gave up. We end our journey this season at Lithic Bookstore in Fruta, Colorado. The drive through the mountains on I-70 is spectacular. The winding road reveals majestic landscapes, snow-capped peaks, green and rocky valleys. The view is awe-inspiring with every turn. It reminds me of the journey we've gone through on this show, venturing out to places we've never been, ready to receive what each distinct place and person has to offer. My producers and I took this drive from the Front Range to the Western Slope for a storytelling event that we organized at Lithic Bookstore. We featured some of the stories from that event in our previous episode. Here, you'll hear three more stories recorded in Fruta from the LGBTQ community in Western Colorado. This is My Story So Far, the storytelling podcast that brings you voices from the plains, the peaks, the valleys, and the hidden corners of Colorado. I'm your host, Luis Antonio Perez. In this episode, you'll hear stories about finding family through drag performance, the tough conversations with the people who are closest to us, and about 1950s pinup dresses. Growing up, Javi loved to dance and perform. Eventually, all that dancing would forge strong relationships with all of Javi's families. We love you, Javi. All right, thank you all. I'm glad you want to hear my story. Uh, so I am Javier Sainz, also known as Javier Van Dyke, and previously known as Spick Van Dyke. And that's how I first started doing drag. So let me set the scene for you. Let's say early 80s, when MTV still had music videos. You remember those days? Yes. Well, that was me. I was trapped in my room, living in Cedar Ridge, Colorado. You think Delta's small? Cedar Ridge is even smaller. They still only have one stoplight. So I'm in this room, and imagine, probably the same size, same stature, just really long hair. And I'm in my room, and for some reason, my dream was to be a rock star. So I started off as a young child with uh, three older siblings, and my father was from Mexico, my mother from the San Luis Valley. And for entertainment, my sister would get us dressed up, and we would pretend to sing, and we would have these entertainment things for our parents. So I'm in sixth grade, nothing else to do in this town. 
Don't want to spend time with my friends. Don't want to spend time with my family, but music. Michael Jackson Thriller. You want to be starting something. Those were the things that made me excited. So I'm in my room, and I imagine an entire room full of people there to see me. Stage lights, band behind me, and all of a sudden I'm rocking out with my guitar. But one thing was very important that I realized. I was a boy. Now I guess I could say I identified as female, but that would be wrong. My family identified me as female growing up. So it wasn't until I found myself and knew myself. So here I am, for the first time ever, on a real stage, doing drag, dressing up as a man. Now I was scared, I was nervous, and of course it was at a bar, so they said, have a drink. So I had a couple. Gave me a little bit of liquid courage. Still frightened as I am still today, right before I get on stage, it doesn't matter what I do. But I was on stage, and people were looking at me, giving me money, standing in lines, and they were calling me he, they were calling me king. They were looking at me like a man, and it felt absolutely amazing. I didn't quite know what this was because, of course, from Delta and Cedar Edge, we didn't learn about queer education. But drag was kind of that first step to finding who I am and being comfortable with it. So this first time on stage, I realized that this is who I need to be. It was my drag that made me okay with being a man. And being a man in front of everybody, screaming that out loud, it's a scary thing to do in this community. But when I started doing drag, I realized this is how I can find my family. And this is why I can tell you drag saves lives. You know, they call us family in the queer community for a lot of reasons. And one of those reasons is because their families give up on queer people. Throw them away. I don't know, too fabulous for them. I'm not quite sure what it is. But thank you for bringing our family together. So I started doing drag, and people started asking me things and, you know, started getting to know what drag was about for me. And then this one person said, I want to do that too. And that was my first drag queen. And she's been with me ever since. And that's Stella Ray Van Dyke. She shares her messages through so many different ways. I think it's kind of ironic that we use our voices in drag where we don't even speak to send a message that's so loud. And that's what Stella does. She does that on a small scale. She does it on a large scale. And she does it for her community. And she shares all of this with all of you. I've never seen her hate anybody. I've never seen her treat anybody bad. We love each other. We straighten each other's crowns. Yep, we can uh, criticize each other with love, hopefully with laughter, and end up on a better side. But that's what family does. So finding you know, someone like Stella and watching her grow and seeing that she could turn entertainment into messages, into families, and we keep getting bigger and bigger. And that led me to my sermon that I gave last week when I was speaking about how Jesus was an activist. And then he said, you know, find people like you, build a community, and you treat each other with kindness, and you feed them, and you clothe them, and you kind of know everything about them. You know what makes them tick, you know what makes them sad, but you also know how to make them happy. And we do that within this community. And that's what a Van Dyke person is. So it's not just drag. We create an entire family from this one thing. When you talk about values and what's important, I think we are all on the same page. We all want to you know, live life. We want to be happy. We want to have our needs met. We want to walk down the street with a person that we love and not get called names. And even when they come at us with hate and horrible things, you treat them with kindness. And then you come talk to a family member and we bring each other up. And that's what drag family is. And with that, it was because I did have someone that was close to me. My sister, my mother, they were my support system. So they too are Van Dykes. And uh, God rest my mama's soul. You know, she was Mama Van Dyke and she was there for everybody. When I was a queer youth, I didn't have anybody to educate me. 
And for that reason, I am a survivor of suicide. I've caused self-harm. Thank goodness that I'm here to tell this story. So please understand, when you're trying to outlaw drag, you could be harming someone, seriously harming someone. Now, fast forward all that to today. Not much has changed. My outfits have gotten a little brighter, a lot more glitter, a lot more lights. Same message, same love, same community, same friends. Almost the same music, a little bit more upbeat. I'm almost 50 years old, and I'm still using drag to share my message. Like I said, I use it in church. We actually had a drag show at my church where my pastor showed up, and he tipped very well. (laughs) A whole society told me who to be, what to be. Never taught me what trans or drag was, but I found it as a sixth grader in Cedar Ridge, all alone with Michael Jackson. So yes, drag saves lives. Thank you. Javi Sainz, AKA Javi Van Dyke, is also the leader of Delta Pride, where he advocates on behalf of the LGBTQ plus community. Lehua La'a came to the Western Slope from Hawaii to attend Colorado Mesa University, where she took the time she needed to explore and discover more about what makes her happy. But coming out as her authentic self to the people who knew her best was not easy. Lehua shares the story of having that conversation with three of the most important people in her life, her partner, her mom, and her dad. When you are a queer, loud, Hawaiian woman living in the diverse metropolitan area of Grand Junction, Colorado, (laughs) population 65,000, you learn very quickly how to tell your story in sound bites. For example, when someone hears my name, or better yet, butchers it, (laughs) they must know what kind of name it is and where it's from. So... I tell people, my name is Lehua. It's the first flower that grows on lava rocks. But what do you do when it's the people that know you best? How do you tell your story to them? So it was about two years into me staying here and being in the love of my life, I realized that I was queer and to everybody else, I was straight. Um, I had a very straight-looking boyfriend, and I decided to tell him at my favorite part of the night, which is right before bed, and his arm is under my neck, and I am the little spoon, and I say, I got to tell you something, and he's just taking his fingers through my hair and saying, what's up? I said, I'm queer. (laughs) I think I'm gay. I think I like girls. And he just keeps stroking his fingers through my hair and goes, I know. (laughs) And I thought I was being all secretive. And I thought I was hiding it very well. He's like, no, it's okay. I love you. And the thing that stood out to me was, I never want to make you feel less than. I never want to take away the experiences that you want of your queerness. And so thus came to be four-ish years of researching polyamory, of figuring out how to come out and how to love multiple people. And it was actually, funny enough, about a month after we had gotten married that we decided to foray into polyamory, not as a unicorn hunter, not to be kinky in any way, but because... Uh, We married because we needed, I needed health insurance. (laughs) It was so romantic. I was so nervous to buy a house with him, to to get these dogs with him. But the second he got down on one knee and said, will you be my first (laughs) ex-wife? I was like, oh, that's the one for me. (laughs) When I came out to my mom, I thought she was going to be really easygoing with it, really chill, just like, oh, okay, I love you anyway. And I think she was sometimes so wrapped up in giving 
love to all the other people that sometimes she might have forgotten the ones that she needed the love most for. And so I was uh, sitting in the city market Clifton parking lot on the phone with my mom, and she is hounding me as to why my husband is going off for the weekend to Chicago and didn't bring you. And I just, I'm like, okay, I gotta go, love you, bye. And I hug up. I real I stopped and I realized oh crap I got to I got to tell her I just got to rip this bandaid off so I call her back I'm my hands are on the steering wheel I'm like mom I'm gay John's and me are in an open relationship okay and I'm bawling and she's just like I mean it's weird that you're telling me this that's a, like I don't need to know about your sex life and I'm like that's not that's not the point that's not I'm not hosting these crazy sex parties. I'm not a swinger. I am queer. And I fell in love with another girl. And John has another partner. And I just want you to know. And I want you to be happy for me. And she's like, you have done the equivalent of putting on shoes on the wrong feet and telling me that it's comfortable. But if you like it, I love it. <laughs> and that is just kind of how my mom is sometimes the last and final story that I have about telling my story would be uh actually just recently in February um my husband and I went back home uh to Hawaii and my dad is Hawaiian and Okinawan he's a man of very few words and the way that he shows his love is through food and his favorite thing in the world is biscuits and gravy. I don't know why. He just does. My husband is our last day and he's like, you need to tell your dad that you are queer and polyamorous because if you don't tell him, somebody else is going to tell him. So you need to step on it. And I am freaking out. And my husband, rightfully so, goes, okay, I've got it planned out. We're going to make him biscuits and gravy and you're going to tell him while he's eating. I'm like, ah, oh, this is why you're the brains. And so John slaves all morning, making the most perfect flaky biscuits and the most delicious savory gravy. And we're sitting out in our lanai or what y'all would call a patio. Um, and the breeze is blowing through the trees and you can hear like a faint rumble of the ocean from far off. And there's a little bit of smoke coming out of the kitchen from like these eggs getting fried up nice and hot. And John comes out and with these two beautiful plates of biscuits and gravy for me and my dad. And my dad was so excited and he like takes his fork and he eats the first bite and his eyes light up and he goes, oh, this is the best biscuits and gravy. And I'm like, yeah, so John and I have something to tell you. And, and he's just like looks at me and he's just like enjoying just the savory goodness of biscuits and gravy. And, and John is like just hanging out just pretending to make more eggs for himself so I can talk to him and I go yeah so uh, I, I'm i gay and I'm, I'm still married to John and I have a girlfriend and I'm queer and we're in an open relationship but it's not like what you think it's not like the weird pornos or anything like that it's just we're happy and and so we're in an open relationship and he just looks up and looks at John in the kitchen and looks back at me and he takes another bite of biscuits and gravy because these are really good biscuits and gravy. <laughs> and at that moment, I just took like this big sigh of relief because I knew that he is a man of few words and that he was okay. And I knew that I was okay because... Sometimes the words that are better left unsaid are just about how good biscuits and gravy are. Thank you. Thank you, Nehua, for that story. It reminds us how important it is to have the support of family and friends in our lives. After the break, we hear a story from Megan Beasley, who tells us a story about how fashion can help us express and find our identities. Hi, I'm Emily Williams. I'm one of the producers who work behind the scenes to help bring you my story so far. 
Our team makes this show because we want listeners to hear these stories. First-person, unfiltered, live storytelling. Coloradans sharing their experiences on stage for the first time ever. And we want to spread the word. So could you help us out? If you know someone who might like this podcast, please take a minute and share it with them. If you know two people, even better. Thanks for listening, sharing, and helping more people discover my story so far. When Megan Beasley shared her story with us, her outfit was striking. She was wearing a blue dress adorned with white polka dots, fitted at the top with a high neckline, and the skirt flares out down to the knees. Megan's hair is blonde and short, parted on one side, all held together with small bow clips. The whole outfit was flawless. Fashion is often seen as a marker of an individual's identity. Megan tried to hide her trans identity from her wife and kids, but her desire to wear a dress took her on a journey of self-discovery. Oh, look, there we go. <laughs> My name's Megan Beasley. Um, I'm everybody's favorite six-foot-tall trans girl in a 1950s dress. I was working for the highway department here, and so I would get off of work and come home, and I knew where every single, single-stall bathroom in town was because that's where I changed my clothes. I was drawn to wear female clothing, and it was hard for me to understand why or what was drawing me to that. I got no sexual gratification out of it. It didn't turn me on. It didn't excite me. It just felt much more comfortable to wear. And I needed to do this or my head would explode as well as the rest of me. And so I couldn't change clothes at home. I had to do it in secret. And one of the first outfits that I really wanted to wear was I wanted to be able to wear an oversized sweater, leggings, and tall boots. And I would go out, and there's people in this group that are here that have known me since that time we were talking 10 12 years ago and i wasn't sure about it but i felt way more comfortable and i was still drinking alcohol at the time and i would go out and i'd have a couple of drinks and that would lower my inhibition or just calm my nerves just enough that i could sit on a bar stool and not fucking talk to anyone except the bartender <laughs> So I have a really good friend who's still an amazing bartender here in Grand Junction. And one night she looked at me and she was like, calm down. Nobody cares what you're wearing because nobody's paying attention to you. And I remembered that and I took it to heart and I would, it didn't hurt my feelings, but it gave me that courage to be able to go, I can wear what I want. And leggings and tall boots and big sweaters are amazing when it's cold out. And it gets cold here. And I've been here for 18 years. And I know when it used to be a lot colder in the winter. And when the summer came around, I would have to hibernate or go into hiding or do something because I didn't have anything to wear. And I didn't have a big closet to put all this in because, again, I have two young kids at home and a wife. And so it's in a storage bin in the back of my vehicle. And it was all just pushed in, piled, and it was like the secret. And I kept it pushed down, and I would get caught. And my wife would be like, you're gay. And I'm like, I'm not, and I can't tell you what I am because I couldn't say that I was trans because I didn't know I was. And I would purge all those clothes, and I was like, crap, I really like that pair of leggings or that pair of boots or shoes or whatever it was. And now I have to go buy new stuff, so I got to buy new stuff. And as time went along, and it, what I would wear when I got enough courage to go out when it was warm, I would very, wear very small khaki shorts and button-down shirts because those were two things that I identified for me as not being stuff a boy wore. And I developed this incredible need or yearning to wear a skirt. And 
I talked to my female friends and they were cisgendered, which just means they weren't transgender. And their comment was, Megan, if you want to wear a dress, just put on a dress. And in my head, I was like, I should punch you in the mouth because if it was that easy, I would just do that. And I worked up my courage and my internal fortitude and I went out and I bought a skater skirt, which just means it's a big round skirt and it was above my knees and I had it and I'm like, I'm going to wear this and I would get very close and chicken out. And then one night I told myself, you're going to wear this. So I put it on and I put on a pair of flip flops and I put on an oversized white sweater that came down to the middle of my thighs and I sat in my car across the street from a bar that I'd been in hundreds of times. I could walk in and it was like Norm from Cheers. Everyone would say, hey, and the boys would defend me if somebody was calling me homosexual or was wanting to pick on me or hurt me. And so I never had to stand up for myself because there was a crowd of people insulating me from that. And I sat in my car and my hands were sweating and I was near tears and I knew I was not going to die and I had to audibly tell myself that and I finally got out of the car and in my head a giant searchlight was going to fold out of the ceiling and just burn me as I walked in the door and the whole bar, everyone there at this moment was just waiting at the entrance for me to walk in in a receiving line so they could point and stare and make whispered comments about me. And what actually happened was I walked in, I said hello to a few people on the patio that called my name, walked into the bar, and absolutely nothing happened. Matter of fact, it was so bad I had to go, Look, I'm wearing a skirt. <laughs> and people were like, oh, yeah, great, whatever. And it's like they completely were oblivious to the massive amount of energy and courage it took me to walk into that bar. And at this time, I had started HRT, which is hormone replacement therapy. I had been transitioning, and I was going to CMU, go Mavs, and so I had to get up at 6 and get out of the shower and figure out what I was putting on, whether it was pants or leggings or shorts or whatever, and at about six months of transitioning on medication, I went, in my head, I hear, you're a girl. Girls wear dresses to school. And I was like, oh, yeah, girls wear dresses to school. <laughs> so I put on a T-shirt dress and some little white kids combed my hair and went to school. And I started wearing a dress every day to school. This goes on, and I finally was like, it's getting cold, and I have to wear tights. And I was looking at something, and I was like, man, I really like pinup outfits. And I looked and I searched and I really wanted to wear this fitted and flared style dress and I have petticoats on underneath my dress and they're different from crinolines which are something different and I own a hoop skirt which is something totally different but it took me probably a year or so to find the correct word chain to put into Amazon to find these dresses and the word chain is plus size 1950s party dresses for women. And if you put that in, hundreds of styles of dresses will come up. And if you click on each one, there's probably 50 different patterns and styles. And I have high necklines like I'm wearing tonight. And I have square necklines. And I have plunging necklines and sweetheart and all different style of dresses because I could find them all there. 
And I have dresses that make me feel like June Cleaver from Leave it to Beaver. And my shoes match, and I wear saddle shoes, which means they're white and they have a black section that makes it look like an English riding saddle because they look like the shoes I should be wearing. And I found these dresses and I was like, holy cow, these dresses are amazing. And I slowly started to collect these dresses and now I have eight feet of dresses. And which means I have over 70 of them. And there's all different styles. Some have pockets, some don't. And it's always amazing to have a dress with pockets because for some reason, boys decided girls shouldn't have pockets because we would, I don't know, have pockets. <laughs> <laughs> you could put your hands in your pockets and that'll make you less feminine or something. I'm not sure why we weren't allowed pockets. but And then I have all my schoolgirl skirts and I have very formal and I wear incredibly complex formal ball gowns which are amazing and I ran across CMU in a giant ball gown once because it was my birthday and I was running late to class so I had my Cinderella moment of running across campus in this giant maroon dress I've started wearing these this style dress particularly because as I was transitioning I was waiting on my body to catch up to, to what I thought I should look like as a woman. And with petticoats on underneath, it makes me appear to have hips. And my shoulders were or are still pretty broad. And the petticoats help to balance out my shoulders. They also make my waist appear smaller, which gives me an hourglass figure. Now, is that what every woman looks like? No. Is that what this one looks like? Yes. Am I happy with that? Absolutely. And I think other people are. It's very hard to miss the giant blonde girl in the 50s dress in a crowd. And, you know, now my hips have expanded due to transition in my backside. My waist is smaller and my chest is larger. But this is still my choice of dress to wear because I had another friend of mine who was a bartender look at me and he goes, I never think you're wearing a costume. I just think you wear 1950 style dresses and you look amazing in them. And I think I look amazing in them as well. So I hope you guys enjoyed my story. Thank you to Javi, Mehua, and Megan for sharing their stories. And thank you to everyone who shared their voices with us that night and in every event in this series of Story Slams. I'm humbled that so many people and communities invited us into their spaces to hear their personal stories and that they trusted us with sharing those stories with you on this podcast. Thank you to all the organizations and individuals who helped us connect with storytellers and hosted these special community events. We plan to continue collecting stories across Colorado. So if you or your community have stories to share, let us know. Find us at CPR.org slash community audio. This show is produced by me and Emily Williams. Our editor is Joe Erickson. Production by Kibway Cooper and Rebecca Romberg. Our executive producer is Brad Turner. This has been My Story So Far, a storytelling podcast from the Audio Innovation Studio at Colorado Public Radio. I'm Luis Antonio Perez. Hi, my name's Emily Williams. I'm a producer on My Story So Far and part of a big team that helps make the podcast. A lot of the stories you hear in this show are people sharing their experiences on stage for the first time ever. If you want more people to hear this unique podcast built around first-person stories from communities around Colorado, you can help us out right now. Please rate the show on your favorite podcast app or write a review. It helps other people discover my story so far. Thanks for listening and supporting podcasts from Colorado Public Radio.